No son desfeno, me de no lo sulupu. Rosoli honesti posen, totelo so chronos ape. The Athenian Theatre of Dionysus. On the south slope of the Athenian Acropolis, you can visit the ancient Athenian theatre of Dionysus today. And it's here that some of the first dramas as we know them were ever produced. The first excavators to explore the site were the Greek Archaeological Society in 1838. And the site contains not only the theatre, but the remains of two temples of the god Dionysus, one which was probably built in the 6th century BCE, when Athenian state theatre began to be performed, and the other, rather later, after most of our surviving plays premiered. Now, the introduction of theatre began under the tyrant of Athens, Pisistratus, who ruled for most of the mid-6th century. Uh, he was responsible for a major expansion of Athenian festivals, including those for Dionysus, an ancient Greek god whose worship goes way back into Mycenaean times and is intimately connected with wine cultivation, colonisation, poetry and theatre. But the theatre in which plays were performed in Dion Dionysus' honour was not originally built of stone. It probably had permanent wooden benches from around 498, so that's not long after the Athenians expelled the tyrant family and inaugurated their first democracy in 507. The stone theatre we can see today was not to be built until the 4th century, well after the premieres of the great dramas which we can still see performed on our 21st century stages. The theatre consisted of a central dancing floor, circular in the case of Athens, but rectangular in some other early theatres. The spectator sat on a bench which was partially enclosing the orchestra and the benches were all raked into the hillside to maximise everyone's view. The actors had a tent, later a stage building, which they entered to change role and mask and it was called a skene, from which we derive our word scene. The main actors usually performed from an elevated wooden platform and there were various interesting mechanisms and props for special effects. Ghosts could be made to arise from a tomb and gods fly in on a crane from Olympus. Another machine was used to roll out dead bodies and other gruesome sights from backstage when violent deeds, which in tragedy conventionally took place out of sight, were reported in messenger speeches. The creative achievement of the Greek dramatists in inventing tragic and comic theatre takes the breath away. Think of the moment when Creon enters the stage at the end of Sophocles' Antigone, carrying the corpse of his fully grown son two millennia before Lear first, Lear first carried in Cordelia and howled. Or the moment in Aristophanes' frogs, when the god Dionysus himself rose across the waters of the underworld, accompanied by a chorus of frogs all crying, Brekkekekex, coax, coax. And then there is the poetry. Even the centuries that have passed between us and the Greek tragedians do not hide the intellectual force and beauty of the disgraced Ajax's meditation on the effects of the passage of time. That's in Sophocles' Ajax. Time, so long, so immeasurably long, reveals everything that has been obscure, conceals what's been apparent. Nothing is impossible. Even the sternest oath can be broken, and the strongest will. It's scenes and poetry like these, components in tragedy of a profound intellectual inquiry into suffering encoded in exquisite art, or the way comic laughter can help solve socio-political problems. It's these things that have ensured the Greek drama is today once again a living cultural presence. It's taught in schools, performed in both professional and amateur theatres, broadcast on radio and appears, appears in various guises in novels. People who've never even read a Greek drama in a modern language translation 
let alone studied it in ancient Greek, often know something at least about the famous heroes of Sophocles' Oedipus or Euripides' Medea. The king who killed his father and slept with his mother, the woman who slaughtered her own boys. The climate of our times has made the confrontational ancient Greek plays seem powerfully relevant and immediate. But they can be deceptive. For many people today, a Greek play will be the very first text from classical antiquity that they encounter, and it's often the first to which they feel they can relate, precisely because it seems so fresh. Audiences still gasp when Medea complains about the unfair status of women, not only in society and in the economy, but in the bedroom. When Oedipus, the brilliant elected leader of Thebes in Oedipus Tyrannus, throws his weight about and loses his temper with people who are trying to help him, he somehow seems to foreshadow all the politicians whose power has gone to their heads, the ones we see daily on our news programmes on television. The pagan, patriarchal, slave-holding Mediterranean society for whom the tragedies were first composed can, however, seem remote. A vital principle to grasp is that the audience of Greek tragedy was, socially speaking, inseparable from its creative personnel. The men, and they were all men, involved in making Greek drama between 472 and 401 BCE, the seven decades from which, with three exceptions, most of the 45 classical Greek dramas date, were almost all members of the Athenian public. Many of the spectators would have performed themselves in a chorus at some stage in their lives, probably when they were young. Others would be proudly watching a brother, a son, a nephew, a grandson or a neighbour performing. Greek tragedy seems less daunting if we remember that it was community theatre and a significant proportion of the men involved in the productions were what we might today call amateurs. But there were also men from very varied backgrounds. Now, Athens' total territory, the ancient name of which was Attica, encompassed many miles of coastline, along with some islands, three vast plains divided by mountain ranges, extensive forests, and the long river Kephasus, which flows from the Parnese mountain range in the north of Attica to the Saronic Gulf in the west. And while some citizens lived inside the walls of the city itself and their numbers would swell in wartime and could have walked to the theatre from their homes in half an hour, others lived at distances of 20 or more miles and would have required a day or two to travel up to town. Attica was in fact made up of 139 separate communities or villages or districts called deems. And the deems were subdivided into three groups, coastal, inland and city. And no doubt that type of regional identity was an important factor in domestic relations too. Village identity remained strong during the 5th century, long after the unification of Attica. Those who were fellow deemsmen of the famous playwrights, Aeschylus, Euripides, Sophocles and Aristophanes, will have known them well. These men were... The playwrights were all citizens of Athens and residents of Attica. Aeschylus was born in 525, nearly two decades before the revolution that led to the installation of the democracy in 507. And he came from Eleusis, a settlement in the far west of Attica, renowned for its ancient cult of Demeter and the mysteries conducted in her honour there. Euripides' family owned a property on the island of Salamis, which is where he's said to have been born at least three decades after Aeschylus. Tradition had it that he composed some of his tragedies in a cave on the island. And certainly there's plenty of imagery connected with the sea and seafaring in his plays. But his deem was actually Phlea, well inland behind the mountain of Hymettus east of the city. And this upbringing may be connected with the many trees and the timbers and different character type of morally peasant farmer which feature in his plays. Euripides' near coeval Sophocles, on the other hand, was born in Colonus Hippias, 
a suburban deem only about a mile to the northwest of the centre, and actually it's still named Colonos. Aristophanes, meanwhile, came from the busy city centre, a deem called Kaidathanayim. And that included the hustle and bustle of the marketplace and was exactly the right place to pick up the latest gossip about celebrities and politicians. Now, particular families were collectively involved in theatrical activities. Uh, they produced both playwrights and actors. And such families were either in the tragedy business or the comedy business. There's actually an ancient tradition that Sophocles had started out as an actor himself and did play roles in his own tragedies, but the relative feebleness of his voice had led him to retire from the stage and devote himself full time to playwriting. The three great tragedians all came from well-established elite families that must have been financially independent to allow them to work on theatrical productions more or less full time. Now there's no talk of large cash prizes at the time, and the point seems to have been to win a claim, which in Athens meant accruing influence, powerful alliances and friendships, and unlimited dinner invitations. It was to an inland deem called Icaria, often associated with the theatre god Dionysus, that the traditional inventor of tragedy, Thespis, belonged. The story went that he was a singer of Dithyrams, and that's hymns to Dionysus, or a mummer who travelled around villages with a special wagon, staging masked entertainments as he went. Now, Thespis was believed to have won the first ever competition in tragedy, held at Athens in 534. The issue is clouded because even centuries before theatre had come into existence, many of its aspects and dimensions had been anticipated in Greek life. The performance of epic, a practice which stretched back hundreds of years into the Mycenaean past and beyond, had included extended passages of direct speech, where the bard recited the actual words of Achilles or Hecuba or Odysseus. There'd also been mimetic elements in rituals which involved mythological stories. And we had they had noises imitating thunder and chariot wheels for example, had been simulated in enactments of the appearance of gods from the underworld. Choruses of the pre-classical archaic period had always played with alternative identities and used mimetic gestures. What made tragic theatre distinctively theatrical when it was invented in the 6th century was the spooky phenomenon of an actor assuming a role by masking his identity and speaking in the voice of a long dead fictional character, such as Pentheus or Lysistrata. Theatre and the actor's mask were conceptually inseparable, and actors are represented with or contemplating their masks. Theatre happened on the cusp between the world that the Athenians could see around them, the reality of the sunny south slope of the Acropolis and the imaginary world of the play, which might be heroic Thebes or the comic underworld. And crossing that boundary happened at the precise moment the actor brought to life his fictive identity. The earliest theatre must have made an overwhelming impression. It combined operatic solo singing, speech, dialogue, and impressive singing, dancing, choral set pieces. From the perspective of the early 21st century, the actor's assumption of another identity is so much a part of our cultural environment, it really can be hard to recreate the enormity of its original impact, just as the soaking of our own third millennial culture in celluloid, videotape and digital images means that we will never experience the excitement felt by the earliest cinema audiences. The Greek actor or chorus man often shed his masculine identity and substituted a female one. And in many plays, the women are giving the central heroic role. Take Sophocles, Antigone. Now, that's written by a man who'd been a senior Athenian magistrate himself. It opens at a moment of political crisis caused by internecine warfare. Oedipus and Jocasta, now deceased, had four children. 
The two sons quarrelled over the kingship of Thebes. One, Polynices, was driven into exile. His brother, Eteocles, was left ruling Thebes with the support of his maternal uncle, Creon. Now, Polynices allied with the king of the important Peloponnesian city of Argos, raised a force, attacked his own city, under the famous seven warriors who led the alliance. The assault failed, but in the battle, Polynices and Eteocles killed one another. The tragedy Antigone begins at dawn after the Theban victory. Creon, as the nearest surviving male relative of the two sons of Oedipus, has hastily assumed power. And the play enacts the catastrophic events which take place on his first day in office. It thus ironically demonstrates the truth of Creon's own inaugural speech, in which he declares that no man's character can be truly known until he's been tested by the experience of government and of legislation. The very first law that Creon passes, that the body of Polynices is to be refused burial, is in direct contravention of the unwritten Greek law protecting the rights of the dead. Mortals who in tragedy transgress these immortal edicts invariably come to see the error of their ways. Now, it may be pragmatically expedient for Creon in Antigone to take measures to deter possible traitors to the city. But the play reveals that human reasoning faculties are insufficient means for understanding an inexplicable universe. Antigone buries Polynices, is arrested and sentenced to death by being walled up in a cave. Her fiancé, Creon's own son Hymon, pleads with his father to change his mind. But the sentence is not revoked until after a visit by the prophet Tiresias, who assures Creon that Polynices should be buried and Antigone spared. Creon does change his mind, but too late. Antigone hangs herself, Hymon stabs himself, and so does his mother Eurydice. Creon loses everything and everyone that matters to him and ends the play howling in despair. Now, it's sometimes been argued that Creon's law was defensible given the divisive nature of the civil war which had disturbed Thebes and the urgency of the need for a decisive hand on the rudder of government. Funerals, as politicians everywhere know, are very dangerous occasions. But I'm not actually in agreement. Thinkers contemporary with Sophocles were heavily involved in the development of a new political theory to match the needs of this new Athenian democracy. These thinkers meditated hard on the mechanisms that allow humans to live together and achieve consensus, homonoia, and cooperate. Protagoras, for example, argued the ability to live together in a community required the virtues of self-control and a sense of justice. Now, Creon is palpably lacking in those. His edict was passed autocratically, without listening to others or achieving consensus, and his domineering attitude towards the views of others renders the outcome of his reign and of the play inevitable. What does make Antigone, the play, so astonishing, especially when it's remembered it was written by an eminent politician in an ancient patriarchy, is that Creon is tested by the initiative of a young female relative. This completely incenses him. Her goal is not political influence, She's only obeying the divine law which laid on the senior surviving member of all families the solemn duty of performing funeral rites for their kin. Antigone is mysterious, arrogant, deliberately inflammatory and inflexible as Creon is erratic. But she's nonetheless shown by the play to have been absolutely right. Creon's mercantile and technological metaphors are opposed to the beauty of untamed nature associated with his young opponent. Antigone is likened to a fresh northern wind. Hymen speaks of wild storms, sea waves and trees and flooding rivers. The young people in this play, given a chance, could have allowed fresh air to blow through the streets, hearts and minds of their long-suffering city and its people. What prevents them it's not just their new overlord's intolerance of disagreement, but the oppressive legacy of their own family history. 
Creon will not listen to Antigone, partly because she's young and female, but partly because she is his niece, engaged to his son, and he's long regarded her as troublesome. But she's also the daughter of his brother-in-law and nephew, Oedipus, a very hard act to follow as ruler. It's Creon's misfortune that she happens to be not only his son's fiancée, but his niece. The play thus challenges the distinction between Creon's performance as a public figure and as a family man. Creon fails to keep his two worlds separate and the drama shows that they're just as intertwined as the corpses of Antigone and Hymen, locked in a bizarre travesty of a nuptial embrace. It's the play's plea for both politicians and parents to listen to dissenting voices which lends this heartbreaking tragedy such perennial power. Now, Antigone is the most explicitly political of Sophocles' tragedies. It confronts the problems involved in ruling a community with verve and vigour. The ancient Greeks already recognised the political force of this drama. In more modern times, the political element has inspired many topical versions and imitations. Antigone has made significant protests against South African apartheid and Polish martial law. So who were these Athenians whose city created the surviving Greek dramas? Current scholarship estimates that the total population of Attica during this period was, say, about a quarter of a million. But the large proportion of resident foreigners, called metics and slaves, meant only perhaps 30,000 inhabitants were adult male citizens. The major theatre contests, which were extremely popular, may have accommodated just over 50% of the citizen body. It's unlikely that the theatre of Dionysus could remotely have seated more. Now, and it might have been a lot less. The evidence doesn't allow us to be certain, but it's unlikely that women were present at the city Dionysia premieres of tragedy except for one or two mature priestesses, perhaps. The first audiences of the play seem, therefore, to have been dominantly free, Athenian or allied to Athens, and male. But when considering the impact that these plays had on their first audiences, it's crucial to remember that the more popular ones were revived in places other than Athens, and after the 5th century, all across the Greek-speaking world, from Italy to Bactria. The festivals of the wine god Dionysus, during the course of which drama competitions were held at Athens, fell respectively in the months equivalent to January and April. The January one was itself called the Linaia and was attended only by residents of Athens. Now, we know far more about the much bigger festival, the City Dionysia or Great Dionysia. This is held at the start of each year's sailing season, thus allowing spectators to attend from all over the Greek-speaking world, making it truly Pan-Hellenic, as well as giving the Athenians a chance to display their artistic gifts to their allies and associates everywhere. Dramatic authors submitted proposals for plays to the senior city magistrate in charge of administering secular and political affairs rather than religious ones. And that choice underlines how drama, although performed at a religious festival, fuse social, political, recreational and spiritual concerns. The selected tragedians were allocated their principal actors, their chorus and also their choregos. This was a wealthy man who sponsored that production by funding the maintenance, costume and training of the chorus of citizens that would be made available to each of the tragedians. The drama competitions at the city Dionysia were then inaugurated at an event called the pro ago which means before the competition. After about 440, this was held in a roofed building called the Song Hall, Odeon, next to the theatre. All the dramatists who were about to compete ascended a rostrum, along with their actors and their chorus men. They wore garlands, but neither masks nor costumes, and they announced their compositions. It was probably on the day following the Proagon that the religious rituals themselves began. And that was with a procession called the Introduction, the 
Asagoge, which annually reproduced the introduction of Dionysus to his theatre in the city sanctuary. According to myth, this procession commemorated his original journey from a place called Eleutheri on the border with Boeotia into Attica. The icon of Dionysus, which consisted of a wooden pole with a mask at one end, was adorned with costume and ivy. It was carried from his city sanctuary to an olive grove outside the city called the Academy. And that was on the road that headed out towards Eleutheri. A day or two later, after hymns and sacrifice, Dionysus was actually brought by torchlight in a great procession back to the theatre in the sanctuary from which he'd been taken. The festival opened officially the next morning with the Pompeii, which simply means procession. And all the city was now in overdrive and a state of excitement. The assembly couldn't be held, nor legal proceedings conducted. It seems that even prisoners were released temporarily on bail. The procession would stop at each of several shrines on its way to the sanctuary of Dionysus in order to sing and dance for different gods. At the same time, it defines by symbolic enactment the relationships between the different social groups that made up Athenian society. The procession was led by a virginal young woman from an aristocratic family and she carried the ceremonial golden basket that would contain the choicest pieces of meat from the sacrifice. The men who'd funded the productions, the Karegoi, wore expensive costumes, sometimes made of gold. Provision had to be made for the public feast and many thousands of people attending the festival. Um, they'd have needed a very great deal to eat. The bull, specially chosen to be the principal sacrificial animal, as worthy of the god, was accompanied by younger citizens in military training, the Ephebes. There were additionally hundreds of lesser sacrifices. The sanctuary of Dionysus must have resembled a massive sunlit abattoir attached to a barbecue. It resounded with the bellowing and bleating of frightened animals, was awash with their blood and smelled powerfully of carcasses and roasting meat. To accompany the meal, enormous loaves of bread on spits and wine in leather skins was carried in procession by citizens, while the resident foreigners carried the bowls for mixing the wine with water, and that was borne in pitchers by their daughters. More groups of men brought up the rear, and they carried the ritual phalluses of Dionysus and sang hymns. So the city Dionysia still bore traces of the raucous processions there was such an important part of festivals of Dionysus in the country neighbourhoods. The processions included the carrying of a large phallus pole to the accompaniment of obscene songs and worshippers dressed in ithyphallic costumes. That means that they had inbuilt or attached erect artificial phalluses. The theatre itself was prepared for the culmination of the festival, the performance of the plays, by several ceremonial activities. These began with a purification rite that may have involved yet another sacrifice of very young piglets and the ten generals or strategoi, the most senior elected officers of state, then poured out libations of wine to the gods. A public herald made a series of anonymous announcements naming recent benefactors of the city. And when the theatre was full, there was a magnificent display of rows of golden money bars, talents, the revenue Athens had accrued that year from the states allied with her. They were actually in practice her imperial subjects and thus required to pay tribute. The imperial flavour was further heightened by the public presentation of a suit of armour to all those sons of Athenian war dead who'd achieved military age before those young men were invited to take up prominent seats near the front of the theatre. A herald, with the aid of a trumpet, announced each of the dramatic productions. And at the end of the competition, the results were decided by the judges. Now, these were ordinary citizens selected at the last minute from a cross-section of all the tribes, rather than elected, and that was to avoid uh, corruption in who won. 
The judges were under pressure, however, to vote in accordance with public opinion, and that would be very clear from the applause generated by the performances. The victorious tragedian was crowned with ivy and led in a procession like a victorious athlete returning from the Olympic Games to a wealthy friend's house for a private party. The general atmosphere of such a party with drinking competitions, a sexual undercurrent, pipe girls and carousing out in the streets way into the small hours is well conveyed by the post-performance party dramatised in Plato's Symposium. The physical demands made on actors were considerable. Their vocal training was arduous. They had to sing solo as well as deliver rapid-fire dialogue and extended orations. They had to switch mask and roll under pressure quickly and often. They needed to take great care not to turn their back on the audience for very long, which is a challenge in the ancient Greek theatrical space with spectators sitting in a semicircle or more than a semicircle. Some roles required a strong presence even through extended passages when the roles remained silent, such as Cassandra in Aeschylus's Agamemnon. Others required conveying a character's qualities through gait. Actors also needed to be really physically fit. Some roles require outstanding physical qualities, for example, that of Io in Prometheus. Now, she needs to leap across the stage as if incessantly goaded by a gadfly. Philoctetes has to convey what it likes to live in unremitting pain. Some characters spend time prostrate or on their knees, such as Hecuba in Trojan Women. Others have to climb onto palace roofs, appear through trapdoors or fly in that theatrical crane. We mustn't be so struck by the professional actors of tragedy, though, that we neglect the core element of the chorus and, indeed, the numerous backstage operatives and technicians whose names and labours have vanished almost without trace. We do know the word for the trainer as opposed to the funder of the chorus, the horodidaskalos. We know the word used for the man in charge of the crane, in which gods could appear. He was the mechanopoios, or the machine operator. The productions were probably much more sophisticated in terms of their special effects and visual design than we really have the evidence to demonstrate. One of the few types of theatre personnel that the ancient dramatists emphatically did not require to help their plays come to life in performance was, of course, the lighting designer or technician. The suffering in Greek tragedy and the laughter in Greek comedy took place by the light of the sun. Each tragedian performed a group of four plays, a tetralogy consisting of three tragedies and a satyr play, one after another through a long morning. The chorus men's last change of costume during tragic performances at the Dionysia always required them to put on the masks and accoutrements made of leather, wool and fur that befitted semi-naked satyrs. Only hours and minutes earlier they'd been dressed in one of the three rather different outfits required by the preceding plays in the tetralogy and those would be the costumes suited to women or men or supernatural females like those who constituted the choruses of all the extant tragedies. Hundreds of classical satyr plays were produced, yet only Euripides' Cyclops survives in its entirety, together with a substantial part of Sophocles' Trachus, Ichnutai. Now, one of the few certainties about the satyr genre is that its gender orientation was much more profoundly male than that of tragedy and comedy. Like them, it was produced by male poets, performed by male actors in front of a largely male audience. Yet, unlike the choruses of tragedy and comedy, choruses which could re represent either females or males, the chorus of satyr drama by convention consisted of male satyrs with conspicuous fallacies. The satyrs, like their divine master Dionysus, confound most of the polarities by which the Greeks organised their conceptual grasp of their world. Satyrs are almost human, yet both slightly bestial and marginally divine. They're childlike, 
and yet their bald heads suggest that they were simultaneously old. They live in the untamed wild and yet in myth were present at the dawn of technology and the arts of civilization. They were innocent yet knowing, often stupid yet capable of cunning. They were pugnacious yet timorous and oddly charming. The single boundary they emphatically did not confuse is that between male and female. Now, their extreme male libidinousness was visually represented in their frequent state of erection, represented by the actors' costumes. The subject matter of satyr drama is heroic myth. Favoured plot motifs are servitude and escape, hunting, athletics, drinking, eating and sex. Athletics in particular offered possibilities for raucous fun with the ligature which athletes used for controlling their penises during competitions. In Aeschylus's satiric Theoroi, Dionysus comments that the satyrs prepared for competing in the athletics events at the Isthmian Games. He says they've bobbed their ithyphaloi, with the result that they now look like little mouse tails. Now, while tragedy and comedy chose the civic settings of public spaces or citizens' homes, satyr drama reflects the imagined life of the pre-urban, even Neolithic male by locating itself outside mountain caves or on remote seashores. Ichnutai Trackers, for example, is set on Mount Silene in Arcadia, where the nymph Silene is nursing the newborn Hermes, but he's about to invent the lyre. Satyr drama shared with tragedy most of its conventions, yet its jocularity and its obsession with bodily functions do betray a closer affinity with comedy. In Euripides' Cyclops, cooking, eating, farting and belching are central jokes. Satyr drama was also much rowdier than tragedy. Satyrs danced and pranced continuously and used more shouting noises, epithegmata they're called, the satyrs and Sophocles trackers yelled to the audience, ooh, ooh, pss, pss, ah, ah. Comedy was actually separate. It was first formally recognised by being integrated into the drama competitions of the classical Athenian state a little later than tragedy. And that was in 486 BCE. A musical chorus of men dressed in obscene costumes accompanied a knockabout actor or two who cracked jokes and shouted versified abuse at an audience of tipsy citizens. Comedy didn't glamorise long-dead mythical heroes in a manner of which a tyrant could approve. It salted rulers and well-known citizens. Its performers dressed in bizarre padded costumes with pot bellies and artificial penises, if they follow. They wore cartoon-like comic masks, ridiculing famous people's and gods' facial features. They mocked anybody who put their head above the parapet in public life. They talked freely about sleaze, corruption and individuals' personal toilet habits. They subjected powerful individuals and groups to trial by vitriolic laughter, which makes most modern equivalents like private eye or spitting image, not the nine o'clock news, makes them look half-hearted in comparison. The intensity of abuse characters suffered in comic theatre ensured that only really robust, popular and clever men, thick-skinned ones, survived to be re-elected again. An ancient inscription found on a large block of stone from the Aegean island of Paros says the first ever comic chorus was established at the festival by the people of Icarion, northeastern Athenian district, that its inventor was called Susarion, and the prize was a basket of figs and 40 litres of wine. But an entry in a Byzantine encyclopedia known as the Suda reports that the first person to put on a comedy or star in the Greeks ambiguous was called Chionides. Perhaps the different names preserve memories of two of the earliest competing comedians or of the victorious producer and his star actor. Sadly, no pioneering text by either of them survives and we really only have scraps of information about the dozens of other plays which were performed between the first official comic competition in 486 and all the way down to 425 BCE. In fact, only 11 Athenian democratic comedies survive at all and they're traditionally called old comedies in order to distinguish them from the more domestic and genteel 
new comedies which arose after the Macedonian conquest. The extant old comedies are all by one dramatist, Aristophanes. Their premieres run from 425 to 388. Now, from its inception as a recognised element of the festival, comedy was intimately tied to the democracy. The form of sovereign power, the kratos, held by the free populace, the demos of Athens. The other Greek city-states which laid claim to indigenous local comedy, Megara, which bordered on Athens and central Greece, and Syracuse in Sicily, were also democratic at the time. The relationship of comedy with political power, the question of who gets to laugh publicly, publicly at whom, remains as close today. And the good litmus test of any society is its ability to tolerate unfettered freedom of comic expression. The history of political comedy and the influence of Aristophanes has always been turbulent. The most savage comedy by Aristophanes is his Knights, performed at the Bibulus Lenaia Festival of Dionysus in the month equivalent to January in 424. This text gave the world not only the term demagogue, a person who leads the people, the demos, but its archetypal example, the Athenian statesman Cleon. Now, he was the most popular leader to emerge after the death of the aristocratic Pericles, who had, of course, been repeatedly re-elected to top office for three decades. Cleon was no aristocrat, but a member of a nouveau riche family. His father owned a leather business. He was a champion of the poor, and he was a fierce, mesmerising orator. Athens was at war with Sparta for hegemony in the Greek world, so... Cleon advocated the stern punishment of Greek city-states which seceded from the Athenian Empire. He understood that the right of the ordinary, lower-class Athenian citizens to political freedom and sovereignty was directly dependent on revenue from subject states. The year before Knights, he'd won a famous military victory over the Spartans and was riding the crest of a wave. Cleon came from the same district as Aristophanes, Cud Athenion, and it was in the civic heart of Athens and included the marketplace. But being close neighbours didn't prevent the politician and the poet from apparently loathing one another. The raw class struggle depicted in Knights makes it the most scathing political comedy of all time. Knights is set at the house of the personified people, Demos, built on the Pnyx Hill where the democratic assemblies were convened. The dominant contemporary politicians, including Cleon, Cleon are sla slaves of Demos. Cleon is called the Paphlagonian, which means both a man from what's now northern Turkey, a place called Paphlagonia, so likely to be a slave, and a man whose oratory violently boils or blusters. The chorus consists of upper-class knights, prosperous Athenians who served as cavalrymen rather than the infantry or navy. Um, and uh, Cleon drew his support, of course, from the infantry and navy. The Paphlagonians' enemies decide to oust him from power. To deride what the Athenian elites or as the parvenu Cleon's atrocious manners, they select in the play a citizen of the lowest class, a sausage vendor, and train him in oratory to attack Cleon in Parliament. Cleon figure is accused for ugliness, gluttony, corruption, bribery, intimidation and cynically manipulating Demos with spurious oracles. He's humiliated by comic slapstick and beaten with sausages. Aristophanes gives by far the best laughs to the sausage seller. Demos realises that he's been cheated by the Cleon Paphlagonian and he chooses a sausage seller as his new steward. The Paphlagonian Cleon is driven out to the city gates where he's to take over the sausage seller's job, quarrel with prostitutes and sell meat for dogs and donkeys. Demos forges a new deal with the sausage seller now nicknamed Pick of the Marketplace, Agorakritos. Agorakritos promises to protect the interests of the people over those of the higher classes. He promises to ensure that sailors get paid punctually and that knights can't dodge the draft. 
and then this radical ending, a man of the lowest class has been found competent to be a top statesman. He's actually a fictional version of Cleon, a popular politician who supports the lower classes, but he doesn't share Cleon's alleged sleaze and corruption. Aristophanes has responded to the contemporary political climate by producing an idealised picture of a functioning relationship between Demos, the people, and a leader from its very lowest social class. Now that has very rarely been achieved in modern democracies and certainly not in public school dominated Britain. Knights made Aristophanes' career. It was the first play with which he won first prize as sole dramatist. The Athenians adored it. Since Cleon was certainly in the audience, the atmosphere must have been electric. But Knights did nothing to damage Cleon's reputation either. He was very soon afterwards elected to a generalship. Two years later, he fought with the Athenians at the Battle of Amphipolis and was killed leading them. Comedy had fulfilled its democratic role. It had put a statesman on trial by vituperation. His reputation had survived the test. And this indicates a healthy relationship from which we today still have plenty to learn between the arts and the body politic. Now, admittedly, comedy's influence on public opinion sometimes had more negative results. Although the philosopher Socrates and Aristophanes are depicted as great friends in Plato's Symposium. The mud which the playwright threw at the philosopher in his clouds the year after nights seems to have stuck. Socrates later said in his defence speech in Plato's Apology that his reputation had been damaged by the comic caricatures of himself as a crazy natural scientist. But the example of Socrates must not diminish our appreciation of the principle of comic scrutiny enshrined in Athenian democratic comedy. Some of Aristophanes' plays, like those of the tragedians, were mercifully preserved in the manuscript tradition of Byzantium, and the first printed edition was published in Italy in 1498. Soon translated into easy Latin and modern languages, his bracing, obscene and imaginative comedies had a massive impact on the future directions taken both by comedy and by discussions of censorship and freedom of speech. It wasn't until the 19th century, however, that playwrights really rediscovered the radical potential of Aristophanes. And that was when a French vaudeville version of Lysistrata in which the women of Athens go on sex strike to persuade their husbands to end the war with Sparta. It was then that the play was censored. Penned by a man called Francois Benoit Hoffman, during the final negotiations for the ephemeral peace treaty of Amiens, it was performed in the Theatre Fado in January 1802, 10th year of the revolution. The printed edition reveals that the play had shocked Napoleon because of its irreverent manner of treating the war. Apparently too serious a subject for laughter, even on the eve of a truth. And in Britain, Aristophanes was harnessed to the cause of women's suffrage. The exceptionally obscene comedy Lysistrata had kept it off curricula and away from the public eye. But by 1910, the many actresses in the, women's, uh, in the movement for women's suffrage were looking to ancient dramas to help them make their point. So when Gertrude Kingston became the lessee of the Little Theatre in the Adelphi, she opened her first season with Lysistrata, in which she took the title role. And the translator was the ardent supporter of both women's rights and gay rights, and that was A.E. Halsman's much less well-known brother Lawrence Halsman. And he'd helped found the Men's League for Women's Suffrage in England in 1907. And he saw the production as offering an unusual political opportunity. The Women's Press published Halsman's translation in 1911, after which North American suffrage groups also performed it. And it was also after cutting her teeth on an adaptation of Lysistrata that Joan Littlewood, the most important British female director of the 20th century, 
developed her distinctive brand of politicised musical review, best exemplified in Oh, What a Lovely War. Aristophanic comedies have ever since continued to be performed and sometimes suppressed. Nowhere has Aristophanes been so contested as cultural property in, as in later 20th century South Africa. Originally introduced as part of the syllabus read by colonial classes, colonial teachers, both British and Dutch, in their schools and universities, productions of Aristophanes began in the 1970s to address apartheid. In an Afrikaans adaptation by André Brink of Birds, staged by the Performing Arts Council of the Transvaal's Youth Theatre in 1971. The birds created a beautiful new flag for the new kingdom out of yellow, green and black feathers, the colours of the African National Congress, at that time a banned organisation. There are many countries in the world where no political theatre or satire is tolerated at all. The right to question through comedy every idea and every person in a position of power is surely a linchpin of democracy. Leaders who do not approve of Aristophonic comedy are usually suspect. A high profile case of censorship occurred in 2002 when the government of the late Silvio Berlusconi interfered in a production of Frogs directed by Luca Ronconi. Ronconi's decadent, vulgar, Romanized god Dionysus, the protagonist of this play, was all too intelligible to third millennial Italian audiences. Back in 486, when that epoch-making first competition in comic theatre was held, BCE, a comic attitude to life was of course not new. The ancient Greeks were cracking jokes from the first minute in history when we can hear their voices. The Cretans who lived in Bronze Age Knossos must have had their tongues in their Mycenaean cheeks when they called their ploughing cattle nimble, swift and talkative. Names we can actually read in the early script Linear B. There are plenty of ribald insults designed to provoke laughter in the 8th century BCE Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, often when someone has raised the question of who's entitled to political power. Celebrants of festivals connected with fertility and viticulture had for centuries held abuse at local individuals while they processed in mummers' costumes, sometimes on wagons, through the streets of the villages. The stem com in comodia, comedy, means revel or carousal, while also sounding like the Greek for an unwalled rural village. So comodia thus means comedy, thus means a revel ode with rustic overtones. But ad hominem abuse, incorporated into a musical drama, along with an often wildly imaginative pop line, was something completely new. The Athenians had discovered a timeless secret. Not only is comedy a political issue, but satire is a democratic duty. Thank you very much. No sons es fenu me de no lo suyu pu prosoli gone